Oh, my brother. Oh, there we go. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Jairo Ricardo Ledesma, and I am a professor of sociology and history at Miami Dade College. Um, on behalf of the planning committee for the 15th annual federal government statewide conference, we would like to welcome you to our week long federal event. Our theme for the week is creating leaders for the future. And if you consider a career in federal service, you are a future leader. In order to maximize ben uh, the in order to get maximum benefit from this webinar, the audience will be muted and cameras will be turned off. If you have questions for our guest speakers, please use the chat feature and we will make every attempt to pose your questions to our guests. Please refrain from asking the panelists questions directly. The moderator will address your questions. Before we move on and I introduce the moderator, I just want to give a big shout out to all our colleagues at the different universities and the different colleges throughout the state. Thank you for uh, joining us here today. Um, and now I would like to turn the program over to Mr. Eric Feldman, who will be moderating today's session. This session will last 45 minutes with 15 minutes at the end to address your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Aro. Um, it is my pleasure to be here and it, uh, great to see all of the attendees on this final uh, afternoon of the 15th Annual Federal Government Conference. I uh, am Eric Feldman. I am the Associate Director of FIU's Office of Governmental Relations in Washington, D.C. So I am uh, particularly uh, excited to participate in this session as I get on a daily basis to meet and know many of our 3,000 FIU alumni here in the nation's capital um, some portion of which do work in the um, federal government. And I'm excited to uh, jump right in and chat with our participants uh, for today. Um, in particular, uh, the, the one uh, I'm excited to have here, uh, uh, Tia Butler, who's the uh, Chief Human Capital Officer for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. This is a, a new contact of the FIU and DC team. Um, that uh, was recently made through, through one of our federal connections. And, and uh, T, it's a pleasure to meet you. We look forward to working with you here in DC. Um, I'm going to ask, since, uh, since Tia is uh, the moder uh, one of the panelists that I brought on, can I have the, our other panelists introduce themselves or my CTD colleague say a word about our, our other two panelists? Hi, my name is Vladimir Diaz. I'm the Community Relations Officer with Homeland Security Investigations. Thank you, Vladimir, for being here. Uh, perfect. So I'm going to encourage our participants to chat questions at any time. I'll keep an eye on them. And um, uh, uh, my colleague, Jairo, will also be keeping an eye on them. Um, so that uh, if any of you have a question that is uh, more interesting than one of the guys can ask, I might as well, I might go ahead and jump in with those questions of yours uh, early on in the panel. Um, David, did you, uh, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself too? Are you uh, on and able to speak? All right. We'll make sure uh, our, my folks from uh, Career and Talent Development make sure that he uh, is able to, to participate. I'm going to jump right in right away with Vladimir and, uh, and Tia. And my first question is framed by the fact that before our students apply for careers in the federal government, they need to be inspired and decide to go that route. So if I can ask each of you to, uh, to tell me and our 68 students in the room, what inspired you to get into a life of public service? Do you want to take that first? Sure. Good afternoon and thank you so much, Eric and others for having me here today. So. I actually um, started my career after college in the private sector. And I was in 
I first was in the PR and advertising field and one of my clients actually supported the federal government. And what I found very early on was I wanted to be closer to where the action was, which for me meant actually being inside of government to be able to support some of the dynamic work that was going on. So I've been a public servant now for almost 15 years. And I think the thing that uh, inspired me most was really the opportunity to impact so many um, other Americans, if you will, by virtue of just the everyday work that is done. You know, I started my career with the Department of the Navy, and although that is indeed a military organization, they have over 380,000 civilians, and they do dynamic work such as research, you know, <laughs> EPS was kind of was originated by some research that was done uh, within the Department of the Navy. Some dynamic things also with Veterans Affairs in terms of the hospital care that is given, um, the benefits that are given to our veterans, as well as maintaining the cemeteries that are provided for our veterans. So the opportunity to touch so many American lives, there's nothing like it in terms of being a public servant. So, Fantastic. Thank you, Tia. Vladimir? So I was first really interested in public service um, out of necessity, I would say. Um, I came to the United States from the Dominican Republic with my family, and I started noticing what we call um, acts of kindness uh, from the government. So the first one was, I think, was providing us with the opportunity to come to the United States. Um, and that really allowed for my family to you know, have aspired to fulfill the American dream. So that visa that was stamped on my passport back in Santo Domingo to come to the United States, that was one of my first signal. I would say probably one of the most significant events was when I lived in New York City and my family, I come from a very poor family, uh, first generation, first person to go to college, first person to become a professional. And I remember being in the supermarket with my mom and I looked at these pink looking dollars and I said to my mom, what is that? And she said, these are food stamps. And I looked at it and it said, Department of Agriculture. And I, right there, I was 14 years old. I actually didn't know much in terms of English language, but I decided, you know what? One day I'm going to do something to pay this back. And um, short story is that when I was in college, I applied for an internship and my first internship was with the Department of Agriculture and I've been with the federal government for 20 years. So I think that the government does so much to serve the American people. And you know, for those students that are thinking about this, look at all of the things, how the government touches your life that you may not even think about, from the water you drink, the food you, you eat, um, the environment, our economy, everything, the government has a role to play. Definitely. Thanks, Vladimir. And I'm going to uh, double check to see if, uh, if, if David is on and connected to answer that question as well. So we've asked about how you got into uh, to, to federal service, to your initial um, inspiration and I have to say both of those answers really spoke to a personal moment in which you realize the influence that the federal government has on your lives and the lives of, of everyone else in the country. I imagine that once you got into the federal government there might have been one or more things that was different than what you initially um, expected. So would you like to address either a misconception or a myth not about working the federal government or that you think is common among the public about working the federal government that might not actually be uh, as true as one thinks, Tia? Wow, um, there are quite a few things I think that are not as some would perceive, if you will. Um, I think there is certainly a perception um, and an incorrect perception, you know, that there, that government workers don't do anything. Um, I think that that mentality probably exists out there and that couldn't be anything further from the truth. I think, you know, as you heard from Vladimir, my um, answer to the first question, we really are inspired to come into work every day to serve, recognizing that everything that we do touches someone and that there's someone who relies on what it is that we do every single day. 
Um, so I would say, you know, this idea that, you know, we're highly paid and we come in and we do very little work, nothing further from the truth. Um, I think the other misperception may be that, you know, all government workers, you know, just literally work in an office necessarily. And that also is not true. We have all types of occupations from blue collar to white collar, you know, engineers, to architects, you know, you name it, there is someone that does that job in the federal sector, as well as the, just the simple fact that, you know, we are not just based in um, Washington, D.C., obviously, we are all around the country and in some foreign countries as well, serving in a variety of capacities. So I think that um, just recognizing that there are a world of opportunities that are available to um, students and or recent grads there, you know, that you should indeed consider uh, the federal government as an employer. Thank you so much, Tia. Vladimir? So I would say there are three. Um, number one is that you have to have some sort of special connections or have gone, you know, to a unique school or in a particular program to, to be able to join the government. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I had no connections whatsoever to the government. Um, so I think that if you plan ahead and you do well in school and you volunteer and you play a leadership role at your school and your community um, and you get the experience, you will be a viable candidate for any agency. So I just want to make sure that students understand that it's an open field of opportunities for, for you and we want you to consider this as a, a career path. Um, the other thing is about creativity and innovation in government. Um, most people think it's gonna be a stifling environment and that is not at all what it is. If you look at the government is, you know, filled with creative people and innovations. I mean, you look at, we put the man on the moon, you know, so if we're able to achieve that, we can achieve so many things. Um, so if you come in, come in with all of your energies, optimism, and really work hard to achieve whatever goals you set. Um, and um, those are the, the two main things that I, that I wanted to highlight. I'm sure there are, there are tons of um, myths out there. I think the main thing that I want to say to students is that you know, most of the stuff that you see in TV, the portrayal, next portrayal of public servants, it's really not what it is. Um, we are all here to serve the American people, like my colleague Tia mentioned, and um, you have to give it a try. You know, you have to dare to join and make contributions. And in fact, you can actually make an effect positive impact in, uh, in our communities. Thank you. So, so far we've talked about the federal government in general. Clearly you each work for a specific agency, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and Homeland Security Investigations in, uh, uh, as well. I'm gonna ask a question I was going to ask and combine it with our first uh, audience question. Um, so can each of you tell us a little bit about your agency's mission and, and what your agency does uh, in this place within the broader federal government? And then our first attendee question was, what does your daily routine look like? So you could talk a bit, little bit about your own day and position as well. And we'll keep going to uh, that in the end, I suppose. All right, so Homeland Security Investigations is part of the Department of Homeland Security. So we are the investigative arm of the department. Our mission is to combat transnational crime and threats. So every single day that you, your family, our communities are safe. So we work on really a pretty, we have the broadest investigative portfolio in the federal um, law enforcement agencies. So that includes human trafficking, um, child exploitation, um, gangs, terrorism, um, drug enforcement, basically if, a person, a good or information crosses the border and it's connected to a crime, HSA has the opportunity to investigate um, that crime. And we have diverse career opportunities at our agency. We have um, about 10,000 people that are stationed throughout the United States and in 15 different countries abroad. So we have special agents, um, intelligence analysts, but we also have people that work to support the work of our law enforcement 
um, agents, and those are mission support. So someone like myself that works in communications, um, we have people that work in budgets. Um, there's a lot of different fields. Um, in terms of my, I'm a community relations officer, so my job is really to tell the story of my agency to the community and to develop partnerships. So I work with a variety of community organizations from universities, um, churches, businesses, um, you name it, uh, consulates. If anyone needs to be involved in the work that we do, that's my job is to go out and open the doors for our agents um, and, um, and develop those relationships. Thank you, Vladimir Tia. So I um, am actually a new employee at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I just started there in April, so I've um, just begun since we have been in this uh, COVID environment. But the mission of CMS is really to serve all Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries across the United States. So when you think about those individuals who receive Medicare and or Medicaid, we're talking about some of our most vulnerable populations. Medicare is obviously those that are um, elderly and or in some instances disabled. And then Medicaid is offered for um, those in, through states, if you will, in terms of health insurance. So when you think about those beneficiaries, um, we have a number of opportunities within CMS. They can range from, you know, physicians who are thinking about what types of things should be covered, how they should be covered, things from a policy perspective about what the actual benefits should entail, uh, partnerships with the states with respect to how the um, beneficiaries receive the services, um, things even including we have inspectors that go to our nursing homes where we actually pay for them to be in the nursing home and we do inspections to ensure that the quality of care that they're receiving is appropriate. Um, obviously, I am not in a medical profession. I'm a human resources professional. So as in CMS, as in most other agencies, there are also opportunities to serve in a support function and that can include everything from HR, uh, financial management, whether it's on the accounting side or the budgeting side, um, information technology from a security systems perspective or, um, you know, an actual hands-on technology perspective. There are all of those opportunities as well. Another entity within CMS is what we call the Center for Program Integrity, um, which is all about preventing, you know, fraud of the uh, Medicare and or Medicaid systems as well. So that's just a glimpse into a couple of the opportunities uh, that are available within CMS. Thanks, Tia. And I see that we do have uh, Dave Aragon from Department of Veteran Affairs now logged on by phone. Dave, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your agency and your uh, daily life and uh, in your role? Thanks, Ellery. Uh, can you hear me okay? Can we hear you? Thanks. Fantastic. My name is Dave Aragon. I am. I work for the Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, healthcare and consultant. The employees over three hundred and sixty thousand employees, second largest federal agency next to the Department of Defense. And my job is pretty human resource management, uh, business degree, MBA, and. Uh, doing nine years uh, and am retired U.S. Air Force after 28 years of active duty. Uh, my, our focus is primarily on recruiting health care providers to the VA, which obviously is essential since our agency is the pretty health care organization uh, within the United States whose only focus is on the care, treatment, and service for veterans. We actually have three agencies within the Department of Veteran Affairs, uh, a fourth if you include our corporate headquarters. The Veteran Health Administration, to which I'm assigned to, is the hospital or healthcare side of VA. We also have the VBA, which is the Veterans Benefits Association, which handles uh, benefits for veterans uh, and claims processing, as well as protection. Then we have the National Cemetery Association, which obviously is a, 
maintains our national cemeteries for veterans uh, uh, are laid to rest. Uh, so uh, basically, we have a fairly organized process for employment opportunities. Uh, most people are probably familiar with usajobs.gov, um, where one can explore opportunities. If you're looking strictly for VA opportunities, we also have a separate site, vacareers.va.gov, where applicants can research, query, and submit applications for opportunities that are interested within the Department of Veteran Affairs. Uh, for the invitation and any other questions. Great, thanks for that. It was um, a, a little choppy, but we got a lot of good information about what the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs uh, does that came through uh, clear among that. Um, so we have a, a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to go ahead and combine some related ones. So uh, several of the questions are about internships. One is the rather straightforward question of would an internship help getting hired? And then one is more specific to being an online student in terms of online uh, uh, students having a harder time doing in-person activities, whether that's on campus or uh, doing internship. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and say what I know about that, that uh, one option for, for a virtual internships with the federal government is the virtual student federal service, which I used to go into in the chat. And my team here at FIU um, all of our professional development events are available virtually for the summer and foreseeable future. And I just pasted the link to Talent Lab at IU.edu where all of those are, uh, the recordings are there and the announcements of upcoming ones will be there. So I think for these questions, we don't necessarily need all three panelists to answer unless you have something uh, specific, but I think um, uh, each of you might have something to say about internships in general and um, anything that could be done virtually to get experience. I'll leave it to whoever would like to uh, address that. Yeah, so um, at HSI, we do have a student volunteer internship program that exposes undergraduate and graduate students to uh, careers with HSI. So um, our internship runs in the fall, spring, and summer. And um, right now we actually have eight students. So we turn, we have a traditional internship where they come in, they work with our agents and they rotate. Um, so we actually um, changed our program and it's now a virtual internship. So uh, we meet utilizing technology and uh, they just started this week. So we have eight amazing young men and women that are joining us to, to gain experience with our agency. And we at CMS also do hire um, student interns and sometimes that does result in an opportunity for the interns to convert to, um, you know, through pathways to actual permanent employment. Um, I would say that while it is one way to get in, it is not by far the only way or even the best way to get in. Uh, many agencies, you know, CMS and my prior agencies as well, we all hire through the pathways um, internship program, which means that even if you are um, not yet, if you, once you have graduated, and it's really within two years of receiving your degree, you can apply. So I highly encourage individuals to focus that way, um, or I should say focus on applying that way, because it's a great way to get into any federal agency um, to a certain extent. And you don't necessarily have to have had experience, you know, in, in the uh, field in which you're looking because we recognize that it's uh, an opportunity for folks to come into government. And in many cases, you know, you are then trained to a certain extent on a job that you may be being selected for. Great, thank you. I, I, I would only add, uh, in addition to the Pathways program, thank you for that information. I did include a link for VA Pathway uh, internship programs uh, if anybody's interested. But uh, we're gonna see uh, in the, um, coming months also increased technical career field um, vacancy announcements these are considered entry level uh, for new or recent graduates uh, great opportunity to perhaps get into a position that you're educationally prepared for don't have the experience in developmental positions uh, again tacf or technical career field and they span uh, numerous and diverse occupations from HR to engineering to facilities management to 
you name it, uh, there, there's a range of occupations and opportunities that may be posted to the to the TCF program. So just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you. Eric, and if I could just add, you know, I would just want to encourage students to really think about internships because I work for six different federal agencies. And I will tell you, um, the internship program really, what it does is that it provides the students, first of all, with an opportunity to test drive whether what they're studying in school is actually what they want to spend the rest of their lives doing. Because you can read all the textbooks, you can attend lectures, but unless you really experience it firsthand working with people in your field, you will never really know if this is what you want to devote your life to. So that's one reason. Another one is that supervisors, once they get to know the students, for example, in my agency, we have direct hiring authority. So all of our student internship interns that complete their program successfully, we extend them an invitation to become special agents. And that only happens if you are an intern. You can obviously apply um, competitively for these opportunities, but I'll tell you, we get thousands of applications and our internship program is, helps the students to put them in a more competitive um, advantage. Um, so I just wanna encourage that if you are a student going to school, that's great. Really think about, you know, volunteering, interning, playing a leadership role at your school and your community because you have to think about federal, the federal hiring process is highly competitive and you have to think of ways to set yourself apart. Thank you, Vladimir, for adding that. And I'm going to take my privilege as a moderator to add in uh, that all three of our panelists are representing federal agencies in the executive branch. Yes, uh, two, three days ago, my, my DC-based office hosted a virtual event with three alumni who work in positions uh, in Congress in the legislative branch. And I already posted in the chat, talentlab.fiu.edu, the video of that is posted up there. And they had some great advice uh, about working in Congress, which the process is a little bit different than in the executive branch. So between this event and that recording, you'll be well positioned to multiple federal opportunities. Two more questions that came in from our group are about the um, about prior experience. And so uh, one uh, student asked if they have only private sector experience, is that a hindrance to, uh, to getting into uh, public service? And I know Tia, you kind of mentioned that was your background as well. And then another student asked a similar question about, uh, uh, what what they framed as limited work experience, but I, I, I wouldn't frame it as limited, uh, but it is primarily restaurant and office work. So how can somebody with that sort of background in the hospitality or retail, uh, for example, uh, best frame their experience for, for, for uh, federal employment? So I, if I may, I'll start on that one. So just prior to coming to CMS, I was at the Office of Personal Management and actually served in the Retirement Services Organization. I actually led the DC office. Um, and one of the things that we were focused on in where we brought in most of our pathway students or most of our recent grads was to become what we called a legal administrative specialist. So in other words, the individuals who are responsible for actually doing retirement adjudication or doing the adjudication of retirement claims for federal employees. And in many instances, we had individuals who did not have extensive professional experience. They were indeed college grads. Um, they had worked in retail, maybe a summer or two in an office, you know, uh, maybe a work study position. But the things that stood out on their resume, from my perspective, were one, their ability to write, you know, was the resume clear? concise, you know, without errors, without typos, you know, things like some of the very basic things. But then also, um, for us, it was about customer service. So although it may have been in a restaurant or a retail environment, the fact that the person was coming to our organization where how we service our customers was very important and they had some level of customer experience was one of the things that we were looking for in that particular hiring um, instance. I would encourage you to whatever position you're looking for, as you read the vacancy announcement, all um, job opportunities typically tell you what competencies and or what skills they're looking for in their applicants. So if it says communication skills, or if it says customer service, or um, something along those lines, you want to make certain that whatever experience you do have, you're able to highlight for us 
how you have that skill set. So, you know, if it is working in a restaurant, you know, your ability to, you know, carry on conversations with customers, you know, articulate what the needs are, whatever that may be, use your experience to tell us why you have that skill set, because that's really how you're going to stand out. It's the individuals who just send the same resume to everyone without paying any attention to what it is that we're looking for that tend not to make it past that initial review. So I just highly encourage you to be honest about what experience you have, but look at what skill sets we're looking for and make certain that you can communicate how you have those skills and how you've demonstrated those skills in the past, whether it's in the classroom, uh, in your schoolwork, and or in a, another job environment. I would also just add, this is Dave with the VA, I would just add to Tia's comments, uh, any volunteer activity, uh, obviously those work ethic characteristics that uh, uh, transpose on the specific expectations are certainly important that you meet the criteria for the position, but I think those character traits, i.e. You know, commitment, loyalty, uh, motivation, uh, solid work ethic, but uh, oftentimes as a new student, you may not have the real world, real world work experience. But if you volunteer, if you do other uh, things of that nature, certainly include that. Uh, that may highlight uh, your uh, fit and potential for the position as well. Thank you. Thanks, David. So I, I agree with both of my colleagues. They're right on the money. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges that students may experience is in artic articulating how it doesn't really matter where they gain that experience, if it was at a nonprofit organization or a business um, or a faith-based organization. It's, it's taking those transferable skills, knowledge, and abilities into whatever job they're applying for. And all of the colleges and universities um, have career centers. Um, FIU has an outstanding um, career and talent development office that they have professionals there and don't try to do this alone. There are tools, information, resources, people that devote their entire lives to helping you communicate how you will be a best candidate for a particular job. So I want to encourage students to really utilize those services um, because that can really give you an edge. That's that for me. Great, thanks for that support, Vladimir. Uh, there have been some questions I've answered by chat about usajobs.gov, so uh, to make sure that information on that is, is clear, that is the official uh, site for all federal government jobs. Uh, so you might end up floating around other uh, third-party websites uh, that, that may be accurate, may not be accurate, but usajobs.gov is the official place to go. And I also pasted the official uh, page within USA Jobs into the chat that tells you what to include in a federal resume, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, quite uh, different uh, than a lot of private sector resume advice. Uh, the next batch of questions uh, from students uh, really pertains to the application and interview process. So that's probably moving on from some discussion of resume and background there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to combine a few of them. Uh, starting with applying. So one question here uh, is, is, is when do you think is a good time to start applying for jobs? This is from the perspective of a graduating senior. The student is graduating in May 2020. So when do you apply uh, for a job? And then once you get uh, for uh, an interview, uh, what uh, questions might be asked uh, in a view or otherwise, how do you uh, suggest preparing for a federal interview? Our process uh, is very similar to the federal agencies that you apply online, although in my position, we also do what we call non-competitive hiring or direct hiring, where we can interview a candidate directly, particularly for some of the positions that are very critical to VA's mission, i.e. physicians, nurses, et cetera. But for the bulk of the rest of us who apply through usajobs.gov, uh, there is a very uh, logical, organized process for submitting your documentation. And the usajobs.gov portal is very helpful because you can save your CV uh, or resume, uh, cover letter, other documents that are required for a particular position and reuse them. But like one of my colleagues mentioned, you don't want to be using the same resume for the same job over and over again because it's probably not going to be well aligned. But uh, one of the things I would say from my own experience in those uh, assistant 
Uh, sometimes it's not going to happen. You're probably going to get a lot more. You're not eligible or you weren't selected responses than you are that, hey, we're happy to interview you. So you have to be persistent and uh, uh, many have heard that job hunt, obviously. You're a little bit behind the curve if you expect employment this summer. Uh, but with everything else going on, I always encourage uh, if you're available, interested, and willing to move forward with opportunities, start as early as possible. Educate yourself. USAjobs.gov has a lot of great information for new job hunters. Uh, do's and don'ts talk for federal positions. Uh, get your assistant, make sure you know. Contact us. You can follow up later via email or phone call. And make sure, I think, as one of my colleagues mentioned, that your resume or cover sheet and cover letter are well aligned with the position. Understand what you're applying to, what you bring to the table, and highlight those qualities and characteristic uh, work traits. Uh, that's going to be uh, very helpful. And uh, I know at the VA and other federal agencies, we do a lot of behavioral based interviewing. So expect questions like, not so much closed answer like, hey, have you ever had a job, yes or no? It's more like, okay, tell me about a time you had a beautiful customer service interaction, uh, what did it happen, and how did you handle it, what was the outcome? So it, it bears on you to uh, consider behavior-based interviewing. Uh, those are the types of interviews we use a lot of, today, and I'm sure other federal agencies. Thank you. So I'll just add in, um, in terms of, actually repeat the question because I want to make certain, not just about interviews, but what was the other piece of it, Eric? Uh, the, the, the beginning was the timeline for applying. So this particular student is graduating uh, in May, I want to know when you apply, but it, it, even in general, how early should you apply or what stage in college uh, should you apply for, for your first level job? Right. Okay. So thank you. So typically when the vacancy is going up, you know, if agencies are doing it for pathways or those types of internship programs, you'll usually see them posted either um, in the fall, like October, November, with the expectation that they will review resumes, maybe do interviews over the winter break. Uh, with the expectation that you are kind of securing your job prior to graduation. And then there are other agencies that may wait and do the announcements in the springtime, maybe the February, March uh, timeframe with the expectation that they will do interviews and have um, job offers and have you start shortly after graduation. So I would say those two are the primary timeframes that you can consider. I would also say if you're in your last year, you certainly should um, begin looking pretty uh, regularly, you can actually set up a job search via USA Jobs where the emails will come to you on a daily basis, whether you set it up by keyword or location or your job series, or even just all pathways. Um, that actual area of consideration will allow the open job opportunities as they are posted to come directly to your email. So that's a great way to make certain that you're not missing out on um, any opportunities that could become open. Also in terms of interviews, um, Dave said, talked a little bit about behavioral based or structured interviews. I think the key in preparing is again, making certain that you've spent time reading the vacancy announcement because the vacancy announcement is typically very clear about what it is they're looking for in terms of candidates for the position and also clear on what the job is. And you then want to be able to ensure that you can articulate why you would be a good candidate for that job and what skills you have that could be used in a position to perform the duties that they're seeking. Um, I wanted to add three things. So the first is about storytelling. Uh, the second one is about understanding the job. And the third is about embracing the agency mission. So first of all, you have to be comfortable with your own story because if you don't know your path, if you cannot articulate what you've done in terms of your schoolwork, in terms of the experiences that you um, gain through volunteer, through internship, through jobs, um, you're not really going to be able to um, convince anyone. So remember, when an employer invites you for interview, is because you have the qualification. So go in with a sense of confidence um, and focus on telling your story. So 
city, there are, there is you know different things that you so if behavioral or uh, you know type of interview uh, focus on answering them in a structured way so what's the situation what task was involved what action i took and what were the results um always smile when you go in for this interview have a firm handshake um and practice practice that's really important. a lot of these skills that i'm talking about um don't think that you are going to naturally gain them. You have to work at them, okay? You have to read books. You have to come to events like this. You have to go to career services. You have to get mentors. You have to go out and practice this. Um, the second one is about understanding the job. Sometimes, you know, um, students, recent graduates apply to tons of jobs, and then they get invited for an interview. And I can tell that some of them don't really know what job they apply for. Um, so really go back because most of the questions are gonna be related to the job that you apply. Um, so really read that vacancy announcement like my colleague Tia said, really understand that because you know if you don't know the job you're gonna be doing, why are you interviewing for it? And the third thing that I would say is really embracing the agency mission. Um, you're going to be hoping to spend three months maybe as an intern or your entire career there. So you really want to showcase that you know what this agency does. What is their mission? What are their values? What are their programs and services? Where are their offices located? Um, go on the web, you know, research and really, you don't have to overwhelm yourself, but when you're talking to employers, really they want to hear about why you want to work for their particular agency they don't want to hear about if you want to go to you know i want to i've had people tell me they want to come here to go somewhere else that's not very cool <laughs> so um always you know think about it like if you were dating someone you wouldn't go and go on a date and tell them that you want to go on a date with someone else they will dump you right away so um really give them that importance and that 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 presence that they need so those are the three things that i i really want to emphasize for for students practice practice all of those thanks vladimir as a, a point of information we started about five minutes late so we're going to run maybe about five minutes past uh four o'clock we have some great questions coming in here a batch of them are about the specific students major students were asking about IT and computer science majors and if there's demand in the federal government for that and one student asked about opportunities for those with a law degree I imagine that there's a high uh, uh, amount of opportunities for both of those things so uh, uh, welcome any of you to jump in on that and the, the same student asked about law degrees also said if there are opportunities in South Florida I know Tia you mentioned it's not in DC uh, federal government opportunities are around the country, so anything to add, either about Florida specifically or opportunities outside of DC. Uh, even though I work in and love DC, it's important that our federal government is uh, spread out across the whole country that it serves. Uh, so uh, IT, computer science, law, uh, local opportunities. Okay, so um, I'll start with law degrees. So yes, every single agency, I talked a little bit about support functions. Every single agency has an office of general counsel. And that Office of General Counsel could perform functions such as, you know, contract review, uh, ethics review. It could be, um, you know, legal review in terms of legislative proposals and things like that. So absolutely, every single agency has a legal department, if you will. Um, and many attorney positions in the federal government are what we call accepted service. So they do not have to go through the same type of competitive um, process as some of the other positions do. So the answer to that question is absolutely. And then of course, um, I'm not certain what the folks talked about in the panel earlier, but in, in terms of jobs on Capitol Hill, from legislative purpose, from a legislative perspective rather, many of the students um, that come in and work on the Hill actually have law degrees as well. So that is, there are plenty of opportunities there in terms of the computer science and or IT, again, either from the support function perspective or some of the more technical agencies, you know, again, I 
previously served in the, in the Department of the Navy. So, you know, some of the systems, whether on the ships or in the planes, um, you know, the Marine Corps, the tech, the communications technology that is used, um, all of those things are technology based. So any, you know, any of those agencies, if you will, would have opportunities from that perspective. Um, some agencies that I can think of that are actually in Florida, the Department of Navy has a presence. There's a, maybe not in South Florida, but certainly Pensacola. Also in um, Panama City, if I'm not mistaken, they've got a naval base there as well. I think it's the Southern Command is actually based in Miami, which is a DOD. You know, there are, I think, seven combatant commands and the one SOCOM is in Southern Florida. So there may be opportunities um, there as well. So those are, again, just a few off the top of my head. But, you know, if you can think about it, there's someone who does it in the federal government is really the best way to answer that question. So for, for Homeland Security investigations, um, anything dealing with technology is in definitely high demand. So we have two investigative portfolios that focus primarily on technology. So we have a cyber group um, and they do investigations in the dark web. So we have organized criminal organizations, they go on the dark web and they do all sorts of uh, criminal activities. So we have, we need people with those kind of skills the other group that utilizes um, technology is our child exportation. We have uh, predators that go online, pretend they're minors, and they try to um, groom kids to do sexual acts. So we have a specialized group that does investigation to prevent uh, children from being exploited. So you can use your technology skills to help solve both of these crimes. Um, as far as attorneys, uh, we have the Office of the um, Legal Advisor. So these are the attorneys that work with the agents. So when we start an investigation, it's not just an agent doing the work. They work in conjunction with an attorney um, that then goes to the U.S. Um, Attorney General and presents the case on behalf of the U.S. government. So definitely all of these fields are in high demand um, at HSI and most, most agencies. And we do have opportunities um, here in South Florida. I would say, you know, when it comes to thinking about locations, um, be flexible, um, be willing to uh, stretch your horizons a little bit because if you're too narrow in terms of where you want to work, you may have some challenges um, starting your career. So for example, when I went to school I was in New York City, um, and then when I graduated to col from college, I went to Washington DC to start my career and I've been all over the place. So be flexible um, and be open to different locations. Thank you. So there seem to be uh, some more specific questions about USA Jobs resumes. Some of them are, are more technical than others. So just again, uh, I think some of you might have something to say about at least one of these three things, uh, but I'll group them together since they're about uh, resumes on there. One is uh, whether or not a resume that has already been submitted can be updated on USA Jobs. Uh, the other is uh, whether when you're applying to multiple positions, if you use this resume and cover letter for all positions. And then the third question, uh, which is a little more specific to the student's experience, uh, I'm sure other students have similar experiences. Natalia says, I took a gap year in 2019-2020, mostly travel, learn yoga, and volunteer in different countries. What is the best way that I could include the resume in the resume a gap year being transparent about what I did during that time? So I'm sure even if it's Natalia's other students have gaps in employment, for example, where they were still actively engaged in learning and, and contributing. So uh, any thoughts on those three resume questions? Sure, I'll um, take a stab at them. So yes, you can update your resume and any other applic application materials that you submitted via USA Job as long as the vacancy announcement is still open. Once it has closed, then you can no longer update the um, documents that are attached to that, app to that application. Uh, in terms of gap year, I would, again, be honest 
and you know, state what it is that you've done. If you indeed focused on volunteering, if it was um, you know, teaching yoga, things like that, capture it as such. You know, there are plenty of people who are professionals who have gaps in their employment history. So don't feel like you need to make something up to put on your resume for that uh, period of time. If you, you know, want to capture that you've traveled, you know, um, practice studying, you're practice using the language that you've just been studying, whatever it may be that's appropriate um, is okay to include on your resume. But I would just say, if you're going to add something, try to, again, think about how it contributes to demonstrating that you have some skill or competency that they might be looking for in the job that you're applying to. The last part of that question was about using the same resume and cover letter for all vacancy announcements. I would highly encourage you to not do that. You can certainly have a baseline resume that you then update based on what it is the um, actual vacancy announcement says that they're looking for. But I would certainly make certain that you're taking the time to look at what they're looking for and then make certain that you are kind of answering the questions as to whether or not you can provide what it is they're looking for. I would only add to Tia's uh, comments, great, great information. I'm gonna say jobs, you're gonna to uh, you're about to upload five different presentation and a total of maybe 10 documents. So uh, as a human research management uh, background, I have uh, a baseline HR type resume on my profile, but also keep others. When I was applying for the federal government, I had jobs uh, or industries or occupational groups. I was also interested because I have a training uh, education and development background as well. So I had a separate resume and as I'm applying for positions, rather than having to amend it, I could simply just select the resume from those five that I have in my profile to really speed up the process of applying for various jobs. Uh, when you're unemployed and looking for work, you certainly want to be busy and you want to be persistent and you want to be responsive because some of these jobs, they're not posted for very long. And uh, for some positions, it's unusual. I'm sure Tia and my other colleague uh, can confirm, uh, we, we might receive upwards of 100, 200, 300 applications for some jobs like a human resource specialist. Uh, so you really have to give some thought and consideration to uh, what's in my resume, what's in my cover letter, is anything, you know, typos detract from your resume, uh, gaps in employment, but uh, detract. So rather than raise a yellow flag because there's a gap, explain it and explain it in a favorable manner. I just interviewed a candidate recently who took nine months off to care for an elderly parent. Nothing wrong with that. It's, it's uh, laudable. Uh, and the way she explained it in her cover letter, uh, it leaves nothing to the imagination. And uh, I, th I think it may look more in a favorable light uh, because she did explain it. She explained that gap. So uh, good luck with that. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. So, so being that we're at the original scheduled end time, I want to use the few extra minutes we're adding on for uh, both some uh, closing thoughts uh, from the panelists and then I'll be turning it back to Hyrule to, to, to close out. So I'd like to ask uh, all three of you, um, what is the biggest lesson that you've learned over your, your career in public service? And, and uh, feel free to add any other closing thoughts that you want to share with 60 students that are still uh, logged in uh, to the chat. Well, I'll start. This is Dave Aragon. Um, lessons learned. Uh, again, I, I use the, the term persistent. You have to be persistent. You can't be discouraged. Uh, sometimes the job hunt takes a little bit of time. You get a lot more no's than you get yeses. Uh, it, it's an opportunity. Uh, those failures are actually opportunities to grow, develop, learn from your experience. Uh, don't be discouraged. Uh, it, it's a competitive process out there. Uh, even with COVID-19 happening. But uh, again, uh, we welcome uh, the talent uh, to the VA and our federal uh, eight other agencies. So be persistent, uh, learn from those rejections, and make sure you are in communication with that agency point of contact for any questions on your status of your application and the status of the position. Uh, there may be delays in the process that are a bit discouraging, but 
follow up and follow through and just keep your head up. Thank you. I guess I'll go next. I'll let you finish that, Vladimir, since you're so inspiring. <laughs> um, I think the thing that I uh, the biggest takeaway for me is that it really is a privilege to serve. You know, I consider being a public servant, you know, not a job, not even a career, but indeed an opportunity to serve people every single day. Um, and, you know, kind of being grounded in that makes it that much more um, important and or meaningful, you know, for me to come get up and come to work every single day. You know, I know that what it is that I'm getting ready to do matters in some way, shape or form. So, you know, being able to help one of my customers, um, you know, hire individuals who can make the changes that are needed with respect to Medicare and or implement some of the changes that are needed, you know, it matters. So thinking of that's probably the, the biggest takeaway for me is just kind of being reminded every single day um, that it's a privilege to be a public servant and every single thing that I do matters. I would say um, that you can really, really make a difference in our nation. You may think, you know, the federal government has over 2 million people. What can I possibly add to this huge endeavor of serving the American people? And the fact is that you can bring your skills, your perspectives, your dreams, your aspirations, and, and impact a positive change in the community in the work that you do. It doesn't really matter if you're a computer person, if you are in finance, if you're in human resources, it doesn't really matter. You can actually affect positive change and have that belief and be persistent, um, like my colleague from VDA mentioned, um, don't ever give up. You're gonna get a lot of rejection notes, but just know, follow your true north and be true to yourself. That's all I can say. And wish you all the best. And I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, FIU Career and Talent Development for doing this for 15 years now, putting together one of the best conference for the government to inform students and recent graduates about public service career. Thank you all for the great, amazing work that you do. Really appreciate it. Great, thanks to the three of you. I would like to thank all three panelists and also Career and Talent Development for hosting this and for having uh, we uh, participate on behalf of my unit, the Office of Governmental Relations. We turn it over to uh, Jairo to uh, close out the session. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So on behalf of the committee, we want to thank you um, for joining us today. Thank you, Tia. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you, David. Uh, Eric, thank you so much uh, for moderating this. This was great. Uh, students, alumni, make sure to, uh, to log into Handshake at fiu.joinhandshake.com and sign up for other important events. Uh, they will help you in your development as was said here by our panelists. Um, career and talent development is really committed to your success. So have a great day um, and thank you. Please stay safe. Thank you. And um, before people log off, uh, uh, I'm gonna, if people are still on and I'll have your cameras on, if we can all uh, smile for a, a screenshot picture. Like this. <laughs> Oh, we got that. We did our best. And uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Take care, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, guys. <laughs>
Okay, ready, set, smile. Wait, I'm two screen. I'm not helping you out. All right, here we go. And cheese. Cheese. Oh my God, you guys froze on me. Do you want me to, do you want me to take the picture? Oh my God, yes, please. Okay, let me see if I can get the gallery with all of oh, us. I got it, I got it. Okay. Okay, smile. There we go. Thank Perfect, you. So I'll be sharing this with the team. You guys did amazing. Thank you so much. Perfect. Are we Thank good then? Thank you so much. Great job on the whole week, you guys. Yeah, really good, really good. Thank you. Really? I think we still have participants also on the line. Oh, okay, yeah. Right, Millie, like we have 13 of them. Okay. Yes. And ready, guys, it's Friday. Enjoy your weekend. Take care. Oh. Thank you, guys. Wait, thank you. Oh, you, you need me to stay? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, no problem, no problem. I'm going to do one more because I don't know what's going on with my laptop. It's acting creepy today. Okay, last one. Okay, Nelly? Oh, I see. I could snip into so many times it opened up different ones. Okay, I got it. We're good. Enjoy your weekend. Yep. I, know. I won't take All care right. of you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.